Okay, so are there any questions before we start today? Remember that you have your online uh, homework due on Sunday at midnight, and then that will be over chapter three, which is the cell biology. And then also remember that on Monday we have a quiz just over what we covered last Monday and today. And I'll hand you back your quiz on Monday as well. We were talking about the plasma membrane and its unique structure. And remember that it is a, a fluid membrane. And so it has these proteins that are embedded in it, but they actually float around. And then also remember we have cholesterol. So you should be able to identify the different types of molecules. So we have blue is the protein. This is the phospholipid. And then the four carbon green chain is cholesterol. So does anybody remember what the function of cholesterol was in the plasma membrane? Yes. So it keeps it fluid under cold temperatures, specifically if you're like a fish, right? And you're uh, essentially ectothermic, and you are the same temperature as the water that surrounds you. You need to have lots of cholesterol. OK, so also notice that um, we talked about in the Golgi apparatus, that in the Golgi apparatus, the proteins are modified, and then you get a glycoprotein that is attached um, to the membrane. And remember that glyco means sugar, and so this is a sugar molecule, and we're going to talk about what that particular type of protein is generally associated with. So that's a protein with a little sugar attached. And so you can see that the outside of the cell is sugar-coated. It's got the glycoproteins on them. Okay. So we were talking about movement across the membrane. And remember that our membrane is semi-permeable. So things like water can move across, lipids can move across, gases can move across. But then there's a lot of stuff that cannot move directly through the phospholipid bilayer. So we talked about um, an example of simple movement. Um, so this is an example of simple diffusion. So diffusion is a passive process that can occur even um, in non-living systems. And uh, it's called simple because it does not require a protein. And so the molecules can travel directly across the phospholipid bilayer. So we can say that no protein is required. And it does not take energy. And we talked about the really important molecule ATP, which could be used um, to move substances against their concentration gradient, which we'll talk about in a minute. So notice that these substances are going right across the plasma membrane and that um, they come to a point of equilibrium so that there's equal on each side of the membrane and then diffusion would stop. So this is just kind of like gravity. It just happens. And so our body can either use diffusion to move substances or sometimes it has to counteract the effect of diffusion. So a special type of diffusion that we looked at in lab was called osmosis. And so this, we're gonna review this. This is the movement of water molecules, specifically. So we had solutions of sucrose in lab and we created a um, cell that had inside of it 20% sucrose. And it'll kind of look like this because it had those little tails on it like that. So that's 20% uh, sucrose. And then we put this cell in a beaker of distilled water. So this is distilled water. So now water is going to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So was water more concentrated on the outside of the cell or on the inside of the cell? Outside. And so what is going to happen? Water is going to move across the membrane, and it's going to cause your cell to expand. 
So you probably should have observed that your 20% or your 10% cells were actually getting heavier over time. If you have a cell of distilled water, water molecules still move across, but they move in and out equally across the membrane, and so it, there is no net uh, gain or loss. So if you found that your cell lost weight over time, then it probably was a, uh, a leak in the cell. So if you found that, you might want to, in your conclusion, say that your cell is probably leaking if it lost a lot of uh, weight over time. Did anybody have that happen to them in their lab? You guys were all really awesome at tying off your cells. Right, so we went back and forth. Yeah, so that's kind of expected. It might increase and decrease a little bit, but probably not by like, 10 grams. It's probably a real small amount. So when we look at um, solute and we look at these concentrations, we talk about tonicity. Okay. So that's it. tonicity. So this is generally in plants, where plants can either become really uh, shriveled and wilted, and then they can actually get their um, rigidity back. And so sometimes, like if you have really wilty vegetables in your um, refrigerator, specifically like celery. If it's wilty, all you have to do is put it in a glass of water and then come back an hour later and it will be back to its normal tonicity. Okay. So this has to do with solute concentrations. And it is relative. And so you have to, when you use these terms, you have to describe one compared to another. So the inside of the plant cell compared to the outside or the outside compared to the inside. So it's a comparison. So we have isotonic, and this can also be isoosmotic. Osmotic is generally what we use in animal cells rather than tonic. Okay. So iso means same. So this would mean that you have the same solute concentration. So we talked about how you can have saline solution, which is just really dilute salt water. It might have some other ions in it, right? So you can get saline solution to put in your eyes, right? or maybe to shoot up your nose. Right? And that is going to be the same solute concentration so there's not going to be any net gain of water or um, loss of water. So in a solution that is hypertonic, this is greater solute concentration. So if we talk about our cells, this would be like salt water. So what did you find in your um, uh, plant cell, your onion cell, when you added 15% uh, uh, salt solution to it? What happened to the water? So the water moved out of the cell, right? So this would um, be, if we were to look at this, this, the inside of this cell is hypertonic to the outside. But if this cell was in salt water, then the outside would be hypertonic to the inside. So if I put my cell in here and say this is, um, usually it's like 1% salt or less, right? And then if my, we have 15% salt, right? So that says 15, this is one, <laughs> 15, okay? So we would say that the outside is hypertonic compared to the inside. So water is going to be more concentrated on the inside, so water is going to leave. So if you think about, just think about salt as dehydrating substances. So if you put salt on a slug, it dehydrates it, right? Put salt on vegetables, it causes them to dehydrate, right? So that's dehydration. We also have hypotonic, which means that we have a greater solute concentration, or hypoosmotic. So this is actually smaller, smaller solute concentration, right? Okay. So then I would say that the inside of my cell would be hypotonic 
compared to the outside. And this is really important for organisms like salmon that go from freshwater to marine. So in a freshwater environment, the salmon is gaining lots of water from its environment and it doesn't even have to drink any. The water just actually comes in through their gills. And then when they migrate out to the ocean, they have exactly the opposite problem. Water weaves across the surface of their body, so they actually have to drink lots of salt water, and then they have to expend the energy to get rid of the extra salt. So they actually have to pump salt out of their body and use ATP to do that. So this idea is important for organisms that live in freshwater versus salt water. It's also why you would never give yourself um, a intravenous or an IV of distilled water, right? That would be really bad, or of really salty water. So when they give you an IV, it was the saline solution. Um, they're used to, they used to think that your fingers so it's kind of confusing because when you're when you place your hands in water, what tends to happen over time? They shrivel. And it's like I don't get why they shrivel because they should actually be gaining water if we're putting it in, in fresh water. And so they discovered that that does have does have anything to do with osmosis. And so it's kind of cool. They discovered that um, if you place your hand in one hand in water and leave the other hand out, they will both shrivel. And so it's actually the nervous system. So the nervous system actually sends a signal to your fingers to shrivel. And it's believed that if they shrivel, they're better able to grasp objects underwater. So if our fingers and our toes shrivel, we're better, we have better grasping. So shriveling um, in when you're in the bath has nothing to do with, um, with osmosis because we have this layer of dead skin cells but rather it's, your, it's a weird nervous system thing, which is making you think you need to shrivel up your hands and feet to, to hold on to stuff. Okay. So if we look at um, this example, right? So in this particular example, this would be hypotonic, this would be hypertonic relative to each other. And then you can notice that water will move and it will actually create a pressure. So notice that it moves in, and then this column of water will go up. So it's actually pushing up against atmospheric pressure to expand that column. So that's how powerful osmosis is. is it's actually a form of energy because molecules are moving, and movement is a form of energy. So here's an example um, what we saw inside of our onion cells. We could see the vacuole because that vacuole had that purple pigment, that anthocyanin. And so if you put it distilled water, that expanded, right? If you put it in salt water, it contracted and it got darker in color. So this is why our plants can go from looking like this to like this in a couple of hours. This is that they still have the cell wall, but the cell um, loses its rigidity. Um, if there is not a um, vacuole um, filled with water. And this is a diagram that shows what would happen in red blood cells if you were to give yourself an injection. Salt water would cause the red blood cells to shrivel. And an isotonic solution like an IV, there's an exchange of water, but there's no net gain or loss. And then it's kind of interesting, if you take a, a, a a sample of your blood and you put distilled water in it, you will never find a red blood cell because what happens is, is that water will come in and it will cause the cell to rupture and so your slide won't even be able to see the red blood cells because all the red blood cells will have ruptured and so it will just look pink without any the hemoglobin will just come out into the water and there will be no cellular structures left. Okay, so that's the idea of osmosis, which is a special type of diffusion. The next thing that we're gonna talk about is the uh, proteins that are in the plasma membrane and what functions they play, including allowing substances to move across the plasma membrane. So if we look at these proteins, they have a variety of functions. 
And this would be like maybe a really good essay question Just to give me some functions of the plasma membrane proteins. One is in cell, cell recognition. Recognition. So our cells have to be able to detect normal healthy cells. They also have to be able to detect cancer cells and cells that have been infected with a virus. And if we get injected with foreign cells, like through a blood transfusion, sometimes we'll have rejection of that. If we give ourselves a new liver or kidney, sometimes we have rejection of the implants. And so this is due specifically to those glycoproteins that are on the surface of the cells. We can have another function, which is that the um, uh, plasma membranes can function in transportation. Across the membrane. And so they can form channels. And so small molecules mainly travel through channels in the membrane. Um, so for example, we could have sodium ion channels. Sodium ions have a positive charge. So this is just an example, channels. And this allows sodium to move into and out of the cells. So this is actually really important because we have to have a certain concentration of sodium in our blood and in our fluid in our body. And if that falls too low, it can be very dangerous, right? So you can actually die if you um, drink excessive amounts of water. You probably have heard of water poisoning. So if somebody dares to see how much water you can drink in a short amount of time, you say no. <laughs> because water, excessive water, will actually cause the sodium to become so dilute um, inside and outside of the cells that you will actually go into a coma and die. Okay. So that is important. But we can actually retain sodium from our urine. So sometimes our urine has lots of sodium in it. If we're getting rid of sodium, say like for example, if I eat very salty foods, I have too much sodium, and then I get rid of it in my urine. But if I don't have enough sodium in my diet, I can retain that in my, in my uh, blood, and so I can retain that. And so the movement of sodium from the urine and into the blood and from the blood into the urine is done through channels. So that's just an example of one. We also have carrier proteins. And these change shape when they transport. So these are larger. So like, for example, larger molecules are generally like maybe amino acids. Are transported through a, using a carrier protein. So if we look at an example of this from our um, plasma membrane. Okay. So this one would be a protein channel. Right? So it creates an actual space for substances to move through. In your book, they also have a carrier protein. I don't think they have one listed here. But by pointing to this one with a hole in it, you would say that is a channel protein. If I pointed to a protein that is attached to a sugar, you would say that is a recognition protein, right? That's how our, our cells recognize one another. Okay. If we look at some of these other ones, you'll notice that some of the proteins are attached to what is called the cytoskeleton. So the third thing is they attach to the cytoskeleton. So these would be different proteins than the, than the channel proteins. And then this gives the cell its particular shape. 
So if you think like a muscle fiber, um, a skeletal muscle fiber is really long. A neuron has a cell body with really long cytoplasmic <laughs> extensions. Red blood cells are not long. They're kind of um, biconcave disc shaped cells. And what gives those cells their different shapes would be the proteins that attach to the cytoskeleton. So we're gonna be talking about genetics um, and one example of a de defect, a genetic um, mutation that causes extreme problems is muscular dystrophy. And so mus muscular dystrophy is due to a defective protein that would then allow the cell membrane to attach to the cytoskeleton. So it's characterized by mus muscular degeneration. So you can be born with it and then your muscles will degenerate. There's some other ones that occur later in life but it has to do with defective proteins that uh, anchor the cell and keep the cell um, at its particular shape. Okay. They can also be used as receptors. So for example, they can bind hormones. So an example of a receptor would be one that would bind hormones. So hormones that are not lipids, not testosterone and estrogen, but not lipids, um, say for example, thyroxine or insulin or what's another hormone, growth hormone, those kinds of hormones, um, they actually have to bind to receptors on the surface of the cell, and then it tells the cell what to do. So that binding to the receptor um, causes a change in the activity of the cell. Okay. The fifth thing, the last one we'll talk about, is, is that they can, can act as enzymes. So a good example of this is lactase, which we saw a video about, which breaks down lactose. And lactase is, is bound to the membrane of cells that line the small intestine. So lactase is found in cells lining the small intestine. Not all enzymes are inserted into the outer membrane. Some are released into the intestine, into the space. But this one, for example, actually is a protein that acts as an enzyme and is embedded in the plasma membrane. Okay, so those would be some examples of the functions of all of these proteins that are found in the plasma membrane. So let's just talk about um, different types of movement. So we'll talk about facilitated diffusion. Okay. So facilitated diffusion means that it is moving from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, but it requires a protein. So this requires a protein. It moves from higher to lower concentration. Does It does not require energy. So I'll put it does not require ATP. So the example that they show in your book is a, a, a carrier or a protein channel that is an example of facilitated diffusion where glucose, these are little glucose molecules, glucose just moves right through the channel. And that happens um, inside when we're absorbing nutrients. So glucose can be absorbed right across the surface of the small intestine and it goes inside the cells. Notice that it's at a higher concentration outside, and so as it moves, it goes through. We can also have those carrier channels. So this is just a carrier protein, so this might be an amino acid. And really the only difference here is, is that the protein itself will change shape. So it binds to it, and it changes the shape of the protein, and it, and it then will, will release it to the inside. So carrier proteins um, uh, are, can also work in facilitated diffusion. Okay. 
Okay, so the opposite of all of this diffusion is active transport. So this is not diffusion. And the reason why it's not diffusion is this, it is not done by non-living systems. It's not something that you can just see within your beaker. Um, it is done by living systems because it requires energy. So this one requires energy. So sometimes it's called a pump. Right, so it pumps stuff from a lower to a higher concentration. So move substances from a higher, oops, sorry, lower to a higher concentration. So that's against its concentration gradient, right? So it would be like if um, I let the um, dye molecules diffuse into my beaker and they were at an equilibrium and I tried to take all those dye molecules and then put them back into a single drop, right? That would require energy because I would have to move those dye molecules together and that's not something that's just gonna happen. And so active transport is important because it allows for the movement of substances and it also allows for the storage of energy. And so the example that is oftentimes given is in neurons. So these are single cells. So they're like nerve cells, but they're called neurons. So the way that the neuron works is at rest. So if this is my little neuron piece of it, at, at rest, sodium is pumped out. Right? And this takes energy. So this is at rest. So I'm pumping sodium against its concentration gradient. And what that means is that I'm storing energy out there. Because if I open a channel, then what's going to happen is the sodium is going to flood in via diffusion. But this, taking energy and pumping it out, is the reason why neurons are so energetically expensive. So if you think about nervous system and nervous tissue, it uses so much ATP that um, oftentimes organisms will try to, from an evolutionary perspective, organisms try to minimize the size of their nervous system because it is so expensive to run, right? So um, they have the optimal size, only the neurons that they absolutely need because they're energetically expensive, okay? So when um, creating a stimulus, so when a stimulus is produced, then my sodium ions are on the outside and they just automatically flood in. Right? And that's a form of electrical energy because we're moving charged particles around. Okay? So when I stimulate a neuron, channels open and the sodium floods in. It's kind of like analogous to if you wanted to um, pump your water up to a storage tank on top of a hill, then that's potential energy. And then if I open the spigot down at the bottom, water is going to flow and it's going to be gravity that is going to be moving it. But I store energy and then I release energy. So active transport requires energy, requires ATP. So sodium is one part of the story, but it is actually, there's another ion that is pumped with it. And does anybody know what that other ion is? So neurons specifically have a sodium and blank pump. Does anybody know? It's called a sodium potassium pump. And sodium and potassium are pumped in different directions, but against their concentration. So in your book, they show a diagram of this. Potassium has what letter, does anybody know? Okay, 
So in your book, they, oops, that's the wrong image. In your book, they show, okay. So in your book, they show the movement of substances. I don't want this picture, I want this picture. Okay. So the sodium ions are being pumped out in this picture, and then the potassium ions are being pumped in. And notice that these um, would be like um, uh, proteins that are attached to ATP. So when that ATP is broken into ADP and P, then energy is used by the protein to force the substance out of the cell. Okay. You don't need to know the intricacies of this diagram, but you should know that it moves it against its concentration gradient from lower to higher, and that it requires a protein and it requires energy. So I don't know, did I put it requires a protein up there? Okay, also here, put requires protein. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about in terms of transportation of substances is what is referred to as bulk transport. So this is where instead of single ions or single molecules traveling through, we have lots of substances um, either brought in or secreted to the outside. So an example of bulk transport is what is called exocytosis. So exo means to the outside. So this would be um, moving substances to the outside. And an example of this is secretion. And it's done by packaging substances in a vesicle. The vesicle moves, we talked about those motor proteins that move it on the cytoskeleton, and then it fuses to the outer membrane and it, it allows substances to be released, okay? So vesicles, vesicle transport and fusion to the outer membrane. So when we talked about mammary gland cells, what was something that they secreted using a vesicle? What's in what in the milk? Yes, so proteins would be secreted. Remember, lipids don't have to be used a vesicle, they can just go to the outside. So casein, the protein in milk, is secreted by the mammary gland cells. <clears throat> okay, the opposite of exocytosis is called endocytosis. And this is where a vesicle is formed. Oops, endo, let me write that again. Endocytosis. So a vesicle is formed. And what was the what was it called where a white blood cell would engulf a bacteria? Anybody remember what that was called? So we watched a little neutrophil chasing the bacteria around. And then they brought it in to the inside of the cell, and that was called. Uh, it's interesting in their digestion, but it was actually also called phagocytosis. So they can take in food via phagocytosis. So the white blood cells can. They can also feed upon old dead cells. So like in your, in your spleen, that's where the de dead red blood cells go to die and to be recycled. So in the spleen, you have these white blood cells just eating red blood cells and then releasing the nutrients so that they, your body can produce more red blood cells. Okay, so that's called phagocytosis. So this is an example down here of phagocytosis. So this large particle of food, it could be cellular debris, it could be a bacteria, gets taken in, and then the lysosome, remember, has enzymes and it fuses with it, and you have intracellular digestion. Um, water uh, can also be taken in in bulk, 
So you can actually have cells drinking large amounts of water by producing a vesicle that's filled with it. Okay. And then the opposite of that is exocytosis. So this is a vesicle filled with maybe protein. It travels to the outside of the cell and then it secretes its substance to the outside. So lots of cells secrete substances that can are important in regulating homeostasis, like hormones, antibodies, enzymes, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that is the plasma membrane. So we're going to move on to the next chapter today, and we're going to talk about cellular reproduction. So I believe this is chapter four. So this is significant because we all start out as a single cell that has been fertilized by um, the male sperm. So that fertilized cell then has to undergo division and divide to produce and reproduce to produce all of the cells that we found in our body. So like us, the sea urchin is actually an animal and it has an early development that is very similar to our development. And so the sea urchin has kind of been used extensively for studying early embryonic events, what happens early on during embryonic development. Okay. So in order to understand um, the cellular reproduction, we're going to look at the human life cycle, which is also the animal life cycle. So most animals follow this life cycle. So we start out with the egg, which has the mitochondria in it, and then the sperm. They come together to form a fertilized egg. This has a name. Does anybody know what the fertilized egg is also called? It starts with a Z. Zygote. So this is my zygote, that's a Z-Y-G-O-T-E. Okay, so in the human life cycle, when we look at the zygote, we say that it has the complete complement of chromosomes. So it has pairs of chromosomes, and specifically it has 23 pairs of chromosomes. This has a name. It is called being diploid. So di means two, ploidy means copy. So this means that we have two pairs, or a pair, excuse me, a pair, two copies of every chromosome. So how many total chromosomes do we have if we have 23 pairs? 46. So we have 46 total chromosomes. This is also written as being 2N. So 2N just means that you have two copies of every chromosome. So N would be, in our case, 23. So we would have a total of 46. Other organisms, like chimpanzees, actually have more chromosomes than we have. So they have 24 pairs of chromosomes, that chimpanzee does. So they would actually have um, 48 total chromosomes. And then there's some uh, goldfish that actually have like 96 total chromosomes. The fruit fly has only four pairs of chromosomes. So if we look at um, the, um, the early embryonic development, this is going to divide and it's going to produce a multicellular embryo. So this cell has to undergo division, and the type of division it undergoes is called mitosis. This is asexual reproduction. And what that means is, is that each cell has exactly the same genetic material. So it's not the recombining of the genetic material. It has exactly the same genetic material. So this would be like a zygote that is dividing and it has the same component. It is a clone, right? So we have a multicellular embryo that could be identical. All these identical cells. Okay. 
So what happens if I, what would have to happen if I was to get identical twins? The embryo would have to early on divide, right? So you'd actually have to break the embryo apart. So if this breaks apart, if this multicellular embryo breaks into two, we have identical twins, and identical twins are also monozygotic. meaning that they came from a single zygote. They're identical because all of these cells are identical. Okay. This is different than a fraternal twin or a dizygotic twin. So if I write down here as a kind of off to the side, fraternal twins are dizygotic, which has to mean that two zygotes, two eggs were released by the female in her reproductive cycle, and both of those eggs got fertilized by the sperm. And so they are fraternal, meaning brothers, right? But they are not identical. They are this, generally, I guess, they are the same um, degree of relatedness as brothers and sisters. So if you have twins and one's a boy and one's a girl, they have to be fraternal twins. Okay. Two girls could be fraternal twins, right? They'd be like sisters. Now, there have been incidences where a female could have sex with more than one male while she's ovulating, and she could actually have babies that have different fathers. So she could have fraternal twins with two different fathers if there happened to be sperm. In the, in the reproductive tract that would fertilize that. Okay. okay, so then this multicellular embryo undergoes development and you have birth and you have childhood and you have adulthood and we have what is called the adult. Now, by definition, in biology, the adult is that which is capable of reproducing. This, all of this development is done through mitosis. So this is growth um, and repair. So as we grow, our cells undergo lots of stages of mitosis. Repair is important because our skin, for example, is always being damaged and it's actually constantly being slept off. And so the cells underlying my outer layer of my skin have to go undergo mitosis in order to repair my skin. So my skin replaces itself all the time. I'm kind of always sloughing my skin off. Okay, so the adults are unique because they have either the testes, testes, and or ovaries. There's very few examples of hermaphrodites um, that are fertile. Sometimes you can have hermaphrodites where the ovaries can be up, the testes can remain up in the body cavity, but they don't develop properly. So in the testes and the ovaries, we produce the sperm. So I, oops, I drew these in the wrong. So that's my sperm and that's my egg. So this process of producing the sperm and the egg is what is referred to as meiosis. Okay. So meiosis is very unique and it's very specific. It only occurs in cells that are gonna give rise to egg and sperm. So if you think about it, as an organism traveling through this environment, mitosis is by cells, is very um, kind of altruistic because it's only the cells that they put into the ovary and the testes early on that will ever have the chance for immortality. Right? So all these other cells are cooperating 
so that these cells can survive and possibly pass on their genes, so from the evolutionary perspective, to the next generation. So that's what is called meiosis. And these cells up here are called gametes. So these, the egg and the sperm, are the gametes. They are not diploid, what are they? Haploid. So sometimes that is written as one N. Are there pairs of chromosomes present? Are there pairs of chromosomes? No, right? So there's only single chromosomes. So we have 23 chromosomes, single. So essentially, we're having the genetic material so that when we put it back together into the zygote, the zygote will have the right amount. So if we didn't have the genetic material, every generation would have twice as much DNA and genetic material as every other generation. So then we get um, the fertilized egg. Okay, so you probably have heard this word tossed around, the genome. The genome is all the genetic material that an individual has. Okay, so our genome is kind of interesting because it has a lot of DNA, but very little of that DNA actually codes for proteins. So what we found is there, that there's about 2% of the DNA, it's of DNA, is coding DNA. So what that means is, is that that 2% of the DNA is what produces all of the proteins. So it codes for the proteins. Because remember from lab, when we talked about that lactase gene, one gene generally codes for one protein. And a gene is a piece of DNA So hence the word genome. So then we'll talk about what the other 98% of the genetic material must be. But from the video, what was one thing that that genetic material could be? If it's not the coding region, what can it be? If it's not the coding region, it is the, remember? What turned the gene on and off? It's a switch, right? So it could be regulatory DNA. So some DNA is regulatory, which means it switches. Okay, so some DNA is regulatory, and there's switches. Okay, so they turn genes on and turn genes. Okay, so if we look at the way that our genes are packaged, the DNA is packaged into chromosomes. So this is the way that the DNA is packaged prior to cell division. Do you remember what it is if it's loosely wound and isn't packaged, what's it called? It's not called chromosomes, it's called chromatin, right? So chromatin is where it's not packaged. But prior to cell division, we have to package it so we can separate it, okay? So if we look at a chromosome, the chromosomes kind of look like this. And they have a, a center, um, highly staining, kind of dark, uh, heavily condensed port to them. So this is an example of a chromosome. These are called this is called the centromere. 
The ends of the chromosomes also tend to pick up stain. And so they tend to be, if we look at them after we stain them, they tend to have these uh, ends. And these are called telomeres. So there's two telomeres. And then we can talk about the chromosome arms. So those are chromosomes. Now, chromosomes come in pairs, so we can talk about homologous pairs of chromosomes. And these are the same, approximately the same size. They tend to be the same shape. And they have similar banding patterns. And they have the same genes. Right, so they have a gene um, that could code, code for insulin. Would be one copy of it would be found on one chromosome. The other copy would be found on the other homologous chromosome. Okay, so we have homologous pairs. And so we actually have 22 pairs of what are called autosomes. That would be non-sex. And they're labeled 1 through 22. Okay, so they're numbered. And number 1 is really, really big. And as you go down and you get to like 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, they get tiny, right? So they get big, they start out big and then they get smaller. Okay. And then we have one pair of sex chromosomes. So in mammals, the sex chromosomes are called what? What letters are given to designate your sex chromosomes? X, Y. It's interesting in birds, it's ZW. So different animals have different sex chromosomes. The mammals all have X and Y. And we have, if you inherit two copies of the X chromosome, you are typically what? Female. If you are XY, you are male. And we're gonna see a, watch a video in class, um, in lab actually. Uh, next week, which talks about what happens when this doesn't quite um, hold true. But that would be the genetic determination of genetic cells. So if we look at a picture of our chromosomes, this is what they look like. And so a picture of a chromosome is called a karyotype. So this is the picture of the chromosomes. And this is a fancy karyotype because generally it's black and white. So like, for example, I have the karyotype for my daughter um, because I had an amniocentesis because I was an older mother, right? And they, the genetics just sent me a picture, like an 8 by 10 picture, and they're all black and white. So this is more a fancy way of doing it. So they color code them. But notice that they're about, there's, there's two number ones. They're about the same size and the same shape. And even though they kind of, you know, this one, actually when they made the sphere, it fits, that's still the same size, same shape. Okay. So would this one be a female or a male? This is a female, because these are two about approximately the same size and the same shape. The Y chromosome is super tiny. So if this was a male, it would look more like this. Oops, it brought there on that one. <laughs> okay, so it looks like this. Okay, so this is the X and this is the Y. So karyotypes allow you to tell genetic sex by looking for the presence of the X and the Y. So um, another thing that you could look for is the absence of a particular chromosome or an extra copy of a particular chromosome. So you can also tell whether or not the chromosomes are uh, missing pieces. 
And so sometimes that can um, um, be a diagnosis for a particular genetic defect um, if the chromosomes are not whole or if you have extra copies or not enough copies. Okay, so I'm going to stop there for today. And then you want to read your chapter on cell reproduction, and we'll continue talking about this on Monday.